Welcome to Mind Pioneer, the podcast where host Scott Donnell interviews experts in health, wellness, and technology. Any behavior happens when there's motivation to do the behavior. That's one of three. There's ability to do the behavior. That's number two. And there's a prompt. The prompt is something that reminds you. And so when those three things come together, the behavior happens. If any one of those components is missing, it won't happen. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Game Your Brain podcast. My guest today is BJ Fogg. BJ is an absolute rock star. Uh, he is one of my favorite people. We have met recently over the last few months uh, in, in a group called Genius Network. And BJ has been teaching us all about tiny habits, behavior change, behavior design. He is the, uh, in charge of the Behavioral Design Lab at Stanford University. He's coached over 40,000 people as of the publishing of your new book. I bet it's way more now. Yeah. <laughs> um, he has the, I, you have to correct me here, your book, The Tiny Habits, the, the Small Changes That Change Everything, Tiny Habits, is number one bestseller on Amazon for business. You have to confirm what I'm saying. Well, now. the Amazon editor selected Tiny Habits is the best business and leadership book of the year so far. Perfect. Wow. That Big is fantastic. I am uh, so proud of you and it's well-deserved. It is, I have been devouring this book and I think our audiences today are going to love our conversation. So my favorite part about BJ for everybody watching um, on YouTube and all over, he is just the kindest guy. Um, I love listening to his habit talks his, every Tuesday at noon, we have an hour together. It's a lot of fun. It's been a huge impact on my life, which we're going to talk about, on my kids' lives, on my business. I have three businesses on a lot of our company. Um, but BJ is one of the most humble and one of the nicest mm -hmm. guys I've met in this game. And so, BJ, thank you so much for being here. Scott, thank you for inviting me. I've been looking forward to this. All right. So, we're going to start out like we do with most of our podcasts, a little lightning round. Uh, uh, you have to answer the first thing Damn. that comes to mind. Are you ready for this? Good. I've not been warned on any of these things, okay. right? Okay. okay we'll, we'll start on an easy one. Favorite movie? Uh, what about Bob? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> right? That is on my top five. Steps. So funny, Bob Murray. That's right. Ahoy, Dr. Marvin. There you go. <laughs> um, favorite color? Green has to be chlorophyll. Chlorophyll. Perfect. Okay. If you could have any superpower, <gasps> what would it be? The ability to help people feel successful at any given moment. Oh, give them shine. That's yes. in the book. I love that. <laughs> like okay. The superhero shine. <laughs> okay. And, and the last one on your round, okay. on your bullet firing questions. If you could have dinner with anyone dead or alive in all of history or right now currently I'm getting harder other other than well no I will say anybody I was gonna okay. say other than like you know a family a direct family yeah. member but who would it be who comes to mind right now Jane Goodall I just so admire I've seen her give a TED talk and said hi to her but never really she's just such an inspiring person Jane Goodall I love it it goes with the author speaker side of things. Yes, she has a book coming out and we have the same book agent. So I do think that could be a possibility at some point. So I'm excited. All right, all right, listeners. My favorite thing to do is to take a wish of the interviewee and make it come true. So if you're listening to this and you know Jane Goodall, hook Boom. us yes. up. Yes. All right. So, um, okay, this is going to be a fun day. So BJ, you have a book out. This is not the first one, okay? You are a world-renowned author, but we won't talk a ton about all the behavior change books you've done for the last 20 years. What I wanna talk about specifically today are these, I, this idea of habits, mm -hmm. okay? This is, this is fascinating to me. Um, talk about the reason why, first of all, you wanted to do a book about tiny habits. Well, I'll just go right to the meat of things. I was doing a ton of research, a ton of innovation, teaching a lot of industry people about behavior change and how to design successful products. And I'd been teaching Tiny Habits in my free five-day program ever since 2011, the very beginning. So yeah, 
hundreds of people a week, two to 300 people a week, da, 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 da. And people were saying, where's the book? Where's the book? Where's the book? And I was like, oh, I'm busy kind of thing. And this went on for years. And then one night I had a dream that I was going to die in a plane crash. And I fully believed I was going to die. And my reaction to knowing I was going to die was deep regret. It wasn't fear. It wasn't um, the, trying to avoid pain. It was like deep regret that I had not yet shared uh, the tiny habits method and other parts of behavior design wow. in a big, broad way and in a way that's accessible. And I woke up and I was like, oh my gosh, that's really crazy clarifying that I need to ramp down the research, re ramp down the innovation, ramp down the teaching and write a book that brings wow. together these things. And that was, you know, there's other reasons to write the book and I have those reasons, but that was the moment where I said, okay, my priorities have shifted and we're going to do the book. We're going to get this done. Wow. Okay. Well, it shows through. Now I see your heart. This, <laughs> this book is chocked full of, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I've seen another person put more effort into a book. This, this, there's a reason why this book is number one. <laughs> it is one of the, like literally the most juicy book I've read. There are 300 tiny habits and ways to sh give yourself celebration after habit. There's pages and pages. The entire back fourth of the book are yeah. all of the amazing little habits that people can put into their life and how to do anything easily, right? Yeah. So well done. And that's a really, really cool story. So that actually gives me a lot of good context. What, and I know we have a lot of kids listening to this. There's a lot of fa entrepreneurial families listening. Hi, everybody. Hello. <laughs> and I, I want to hear for a minute, um, if you could boil down this book into a simple, understanded idea, Yeah. what would be your bumper sticker? There are two that would squish together on one sticker. It's number one, help yourself do what you already want to do. And number two, help yourself feel successful. Mm. Help yourself those, do what you already want to do and help yourself feel successful. Okay. Yeah, and those are in the book and I call them the maxims. And those are the keys to creating lasting change in yourself. Or if it's others, it's help, help other people do what they already want to do. Help other people feel successful. Those are the keys. And Tiny Habits is a method to achieve that in other ways, um, but... Those are the things you're shooting for when you're shooting for engagement, lasting change, um, and habits that will continue over time. I love it. And, and what makes you, what makes you feel successful? What is, what is, what oh. makes you your, your heart <laughs> Um, I just got off, um, some training I did with professionals in my boot camp, and man, so this was a follow-up like three weeks later. Uh, after the boot camp wrapped up, and this was a follow-on, and just hearing people who have used my methods, and and this wasn't for their personal habits. This was to create products and services that are good for people. To hear the success stories and how quickly they are able to apply my methods and how game-changing it was, and then I'll give another specific example. Yesterday, I was talking to one of my boot campers. It's been only to day one of four days of the boot camp. And I was following up between sessions and he says, BJ, uh, these have been the most productive days of my career in the last eight years. And he explained why. So for me to help people achieve, well, yes, be more efficient, be more productive, but that's in the service of them achieving their dreams, professional dreams or personal dreams. That's really what my life's about is, is helping, teaching people how to be healthy healthier and happier. And here are the methods, here are the models, and here, here's how you apply them. It's not good enough to just be a theory. It's not good enough just to be an academic paper right. that people might cite. I have to be practical. I have to have impact in the world. And so hearing the success stories, man, that's for me, it's like, boom, okay, yay. You know, um, good for that person that they were able to apply it and that they took the steps. And you know, and I know, and everybody listening to this knows, when you do a new venture, when you new, do a book, you're investing a lot of your life and time into that. Yeah. So to feel like that is paying off in the ways I had hoped, that's when I feel successful. Okay, well, I got to share, because th this is the podcast for anybody who wants to overcome an issue in their life, to learn a habit, to change a behavior, 
and, and figure out why there's roadblocks, why they can't do it, why it's a struggle. And I have one quick story that you've already done. So, you know, mm -hmm. kind of the passion project in my life is the myfirstsale.com, right? Mm -hmm. A bunch of kids launching businesses all over America and now all over the world. They come in and they do a week of training, like a couple hours, the little videos that we have for them, a week of prep, and then they launch their business to the whole world, right? Nice. And they make several hundred dollars and then they celebrate the shine moment. They do a huge yeah. celebration with their family nice. now, <laughs> and then they can turn off their business, right? They've learned a ton about entrepreneurship or they keep going. We implemented, and for you listeners out there, we implemented specific tiny motivators for kids after they finished parts of their checklists to give themselves a little celebration. We, we made um, some of the things that we realized were too hard. It took too much ability, right? We, we yeah. simplified for them. And then we, we increase their motivation with fun rewards, right? They can earn swag once they finish certain, we literally kind of revamped our training nice. program. And yeah. we just had our first girl go through it. Um, she is 13 years old. Good girl. Awesome. Um, an African-American girl made cookies. I, I believe it was Kaylin. I forget I, I, if it wasn't Kaylin. I'm so sorry. I think it was Kaylin was her name. Um, I'm interviewing her in a few days. She just launched her business in Maryland and she made $900 oh, on her me. launch day to all of her community um, in selling these little, they're heart cookies. They're little beautiful, healthy, thin heart cookies sold by the dozens. And what a great she, idea. Well, and she, the main thing she said was I, it was so simple and I, it, it was an idea I've wanted to do for a long time. Now, when I joined the My First Sale program, which is using your ideas, BJ, it, it, she said each step was so simple for me, I was able to celebrate and be excited the whole way through. And she did, I mean, our average student is like 200. She just did 900. And so just wow. seeing these kids successful gives me the feeling of success. I love watching these kids be successful. So I got to share with you, that was one of the coolest experiences of the last week for me is watching this girl just crush yeah. it with her family and friends and her neighborhood. I mean, she was doing little fun celebrations. She would go talk to the school, the school posted on their Facebook. They, they had little things. They said, I'm going to do one house today where they went to their neighbor and dropped off a card. And yeah. then they, because yeah. they were already in so flow, good. they did 50, that right? Yeah, you know, getting started is often the hardest thing. In fact, it usually so you know, just boom, take that next step and keep going. Yeah. Okay. And I got a plenty more stories, but I won't say them yet. Let's okay, get into let, let me let me comment on that. Nine hundred dollars okay. is terrific and it's great, but the benefit goes way beyond the money. You know yes. that. And I'm sure you've talked about this before. You know, the money is one way of tracking impact. Right, But really the benefit to her and the people she's worked with and the people she's serving and all of that, that's, it's, that's so much bigger uh, than the money itself. Oh, absolutely. The confidence yeah. from it is what yeah. she got. So she's good. like, wow, I could do this. This is awesome. And that and giving kids confidence for the future is, is priority one, right? The future is exciting. Tomorrow has more opportunity than yesterday. Mm -hmm. She's pumped for the future. She can't wait to figure out the next one, right? I wish I had that sort of thinking all day, every day. So, okay. We have got to get into this. Can we talk about map? Can we talk about yes. the, the three things that make up um, a tiny habit? And then we can talk about map for a minute. So yeah. let's get into education mode and, and tell the listeners what this is really about. Okay. This won't be too complicated because at the end of the day, behavior, the way behavior works is pretty simple and it's way simpler than people think. And this model came together for me in 2007, and I call it the fog behavior model. Behavior, any behavior, whether it's a habit or a one-time behavior like uh, buying something or um, you know, going to Hawaii on a vacation, any behavior happens when there's motivation to do the behavior, that's one of three. There's ability to do the behavior, that's number two. And there's a prompt. The prompt is something that reminds you and so when those three things come together, the behavior happens. If any one of those components is missing, it won't happen. And so I write it out as B equals MAP. It's not strictly an equation. You can't do algebra with it, but it is a model that it's like an answer to a riddle. This is how all human behavior works. It's a function of motivation, ability, and prompt. And that is that for me was the breakthrough in then 
creating the tiny habits method, the other models and methods of behavior design and so on. And that model is being used widely. Every day I get emails asking for permission to use it in different ways. And so that uh, people are recognizing that that was um, sort of like E, e equals MC squared, except yeah. for it's behavior. So it really is that simple to be able to understand behavior. It's always uh, uh, those three components coming together at the same moment. So, so motivation, ability, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. a prompt. My motivation, my desire to the level of wanting to do something. Yes. Yes. My ability, which means the ease with which I can do it. Yes. And then a prompt having the perfect visual or audible or whatever. It's a trigger that something that's right there in front of yeah. me at the right time to make it happen. Right. Yes. But we can also self prompt. We can just say, Oh my gosh, I got to call my mom. Right. right. And so prompts can come from different directions. Self prompting is not ideal because it relies on your memory. So there's three different sources of prompts and we may not want to get into that kind of detail, but the prompt is the thing that says, do this now. Um, uh, say, for example, I, I decided I need to buy some tart cherry juice. So I'm motivated to do it. I have the, oh, and you know why? Guess what? Have the instructions, Scott. I read it. <laughs> I don't know when. I get, so I read these really great instructions for this product I have, and it said tart cherry juice. So I'm motivated to buy it for better sleep. I'm able to buy it. I can afford it. But when I go to the grocery store, if I don't have something that reminds me, I'm not going to buy it, right? So you've got to have something, whether it's my partner saying, don't forget the cherry juice, or it's a little note, or um, something that says, remember to buy it. So yep. a lot of times we are motivated and we're able, but we're lacking the prompt. So it doesn't get done. That's right. So let's, let's take another one for me, flossing. Okay. And I ah. love this example that you give. I am terrible at flossing and I don't know why <laughs> my whole life. I, I think I, I, I convinced myself when I got a Sonicare that, oh, that you does most it. of it. I do yeah. it twice. I brush twice a day, once in the morning and once in the night. And one of my best friends is, is my dentist, Dr. Gabe Woodruff. And he's, you know, one time he told me finally that if you don't get the gunk out between your teeth, mm. it can go into your stomach and cause problems. Like the germs can cause, you know, decay in your gut. And that immediately changed my motivation level. Yeah. I was yeah. like, oh, I don't want that. So I immediately started flossing a bunch right after that happened, but it's still been a problem. Um, and I realized the other day you know, that I, my flosser was not in the right place. It was in a very That's different part to do. of, yeah. yeah, it was. So I was, I wasn't opening the drawer because my yeah. toothbrush and toothpaste were over here. Right. So although that motivation has been high in my mind for years, the prompt wasn't there. And I also had the string the string floss that was yeah, like yeah. kind of annoying and you got to wrap it around your fingers and lose some blood flow and, <laughs> you know, try to get it between your teeth. So then I got, because of this book, I get the, the flosser with the handle where it's just like, boom, boom, yeah, boom, 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 yeah. boom, boom, boom. And it's way better. And, you know, and you knock it out. And, and then I realized, okay, the prompt's not there. Right. Mm -hmm. So the flosser had to go on the toothbrush, Bam, right? Right there, right there in front of me. And then I real then in the book, you talk about, you know, maybe instead of trying to convince yourself, you got to get every little piece of plaque out and every little thing with every tooth. Why not just one tooth? Right. Yeah. Lower the bar, lower, lower the, bar. the bar, keep it simple. So I just said, okay, I'm just going to do start with one tooth. All I have to do is one tooth. And then because my mind made it that way, it was so simple. I did the tooth and I'm like, oh, okay, I'll just do the rest of the teeth. Right. <laughs> and it was yeah. very, very easy. So that is how I, hacked my ability to floss my teeth right using such this a good what a great story that's right on i mean and it, and people can apply that to so many aspects of their life because there are patterns and this is what i learned in coaching i mean i stopped counting at forty thousand, and that, and this is personal this is like i'm interacting with people on email one by one there are patterns of change and you've outlined one of the patterns which is make it easy to do and so you have motivation, make it really easy. And then if you're not doing it, then check the prompt. You know, how am I going to remind myself to do this? And sometimes you take the physical object you need, like the floss or the little handled uh, floss yep. that you're using, and you use that 
to be your reminder. You set it out. So, you, and that technique is called staging. So in my Stanford lab, we've named different techniques of behavior change. And when you use the actual object you need to do the behavior and you use that as your reminder, then you're doing this technique called staging. So congratulations, Scott, you staged this and it, it worked. Awesome. So yeah, let's get into more of the, I want to know more of the, uh, the techniques. So staging is one of them. What are a couple of the other ones? Oh, there's various. So you can map it to motivation, ability, and prompt. So um, sometimes what you need to do is, um, it, it, there's actually seven different things. And, and now we're going to get a little bit geeky. If behavior one leads to behavior two, and I'll, I'll just keep it to three. Okay. If you, behavior one can make behavior two more motivating. So say you're not flossing, you watch a video about flossing as behavior one, which okay. increases your motivation for behavior two, which is flossing. So in that case, behavior one, watching the video, uh, is designed to increase your motivation because maybe that's what you're lacking. If what you're lacking for flossing is ability, then getting the floss out of the drawer and putting it on the counter, which is a behavior, then gets behavior two to happen, which is flossing. Or if prompt is lacking, there's different ways to design a prompt. And I'm being prompted by my... Uh, phone right now at the wrong time, even though it's supposed to be on silent, right? <laughs> prompts, prompts, can be prompt. like, prompts can be like not great. They can be poorly designed like that one. Right. But Don't worry, I just put mine on, on airplane mode just because of what you did. <laughs> Good job. Well, uh, you prompted me to put my phone yeah, on airplane mode. There we go. Mode. So prompts can come from lots of directions, but if what if you're motivated and able, then you, you just have to say, well, what's going to prompt or remind me to do this? Okay. And when you combine MAMP and different permutations of seven possible solves. We've written a paper with different names. It's a little bit geeky to go into that, but just the thing to think about is for any given behavior that uh, you want to happen, you can analyze. Is it a motivation problem or an ability problem? Or am I lacking a prompt? And then design to get the motivation there or make it easier or make sure there's a prompt. So there's a systematic way to think about it yep. and there's a systematic way to design for it. I love that you just dissected it, right? You, you just pulled apart why every, everyone listening can think about this for a second. What is one thing that you've wanted to do, but you just never do it and you struggle yeah. to do it or you forget to do it, or you're like, Oh my gosh, I got to stop doing that. Right. And you just pulled it apart. Is, is my motivation actually high enough? What do I need to do to get my motivation there? Yeah. What, is my ability actually there or is it not there? And how do I make the ability easier right in front of me? And then the prompt, which type of prompt yeah. do I need to get myself to that habit? And Scott, there's a twist here. And let me give the twist. If you want somebody else to do a behavior and they're not doing it, well, it's because either they're lacking motivation or they're lacking ability or they're lacking a prompt or some combination. We'll just stick with those three. There's an order of troubleshooting. So let's say that you want, uh, I'll pick something really simple. I want my partner, uh, so I go surfing every morning and let's say I want my partner to fill up a, a thermos. Which is amazing, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I went this morning. Waves weren't so great this morning, but it was beautiful. So let's say I want my partner to fill up a coffee thermos for me every morning. Well, in reality, I do my own coffee, but for the sake of the example. And so... Once I make that behavior clear to him, like, hey, would you make sure I have a coffee thermos ready to go? And he's not doing it. Most people would make the mistake of going to motivation, like getting upset or explaining why. That's the wrong place to start. You actually start with the prompt. Make sure there's something that prompts that person to do the behavior. Okay. Because they may be plenty motivated and they may have the ability. So you troubleshoot by saying, is there a prompt? Is there a reminder for my partner? And you make sure there is one. And many, uh, in many situations, that resolves the problem. So you don't have to get upset. You don't have to get in a fight. You don't have to get emotional. Why don't they like me? Why don't they care about <laughs> exactly. me? Why don't they love me? What's but, wrong with them? <laughs> and that's the twist because most people start there. Now, if there is a prompt and the person's still not doing the behavior, then you look at ability. Is it easy enough to do? Right? We're still yeah. not to motivation wow. yet. And I'm writing then, this down because this is so smart. Yeah. Well, this will save many relationships or yes. many moments in a relationship. Or parenting. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's like, okay, 
let's, let's make it easier to do, like as easy as possible. And most of the time, if you've solved for the prompt and you've made it easy to do, it will happen. If it's still not happening, then you know it's a motivation problem, mm. which is the hardest to deal with. So there's an order to this, a systematic way. And then if it ends up being a motivation problem, then it's like, okay, now I have to figure out maybe this is even the wrong behavior for this person. Why am I trying to get somebody to do something they don't want to do? So you mm. have that question. Yeah. But if for some reason they really need to do it, like pick up their room or you know clean the sink, well, then you may have to mess around with motivation to get it to happen. But you, you only do that as a last resort. You don't do that first. You do that last. Gotcha. Oh, my goodness. Why didn't you call it Pam then? <laughs> <laughs> well, because for the design order, so that's the troubleshooting order. Yeah, I get it. Design I get it. order goes the other direction. Pick behaviors that people want to do, make sure it's really easy, and then make sure there's a prompt. So there's one direction for design. Yep the other direction for troubleshooting. Yeah, that's good. It's like a car, check, check the <laughs> wheels, check the hood, and then you can go into the engine. Yeah, that's smart. Okay, well, I love this. Okay, so let's do a real-time one with me. You ready? Okay, ready. So I really struggle with my morning routine. I've got okay. three young kids. I'm a lot like many of the listeners here. Uh, busy, you know, I run lots of businesses and, uh, hundreds of emails. I got just so much going on. I pass out for part of the night or I don't sleep too well. I put my happy under my pillow, which helps a lot. But in the, in the morning time, my morning routine is just crazy. A kid wakes up, you know, my, my two-year-old yeah. Sawyer yeah. might wake up in the, you know, four o'clock and I'm like, oh, there goes my workout. I can't even think straight. How can I go work out? Or, you know, and, and I, I would love to have, I'd wake up at 630 I'd love to be able to do a devotion, just some like quiet time, some meditation, prayer time. Um, and obviously the brushing teeth, going to the bathroom, yeah. putting on clothes thing. Yeah. Um, that's normal because I, that, or else I'll be a social outcast <laughs> if I walk out smelly and naked. But those are normal. But I would love that I struggle with that meditation, quiet time yeah. in the midst of crazy. And yeah. I always miss it. And, you know, I, I, get down on myself. I get sad. I get, I know I don't have the best day when that happens. Right. So what can I do? And then I, in my mind, I'm like, okay, give yourself a break. You've got three little kids and life is crazy. And, but you know, and then I would, I usually can try to do a workout after that to kind of get my morning mm -hmm. ready, you know, and that's mm -hmm. a great morning for me before the work day yeah. and then shower and then work. But I miss that quiet time and that meditation time. I miss it. And I miss it. Like I yeah. miss doing it. Not I miss it because I don't do it, but I miss doing it because I know I am yeah. have a better day and I'm more centered and balanced. So what do I do, BJ? Help Terrific. Me. Well, I have your answer. It's not like do this. It's a process. Just like everything, the way behavior works is a system. The way you design behaviors is a system. And that's what I'm explaining for, in Tiny Habits for the first time is it's a system. So I, I know how to walk you through the system. The first thing, well, let, let me fact check this. So you feel like it needs to happen in the morning, that that moment of quiet, that devotion morning. And it's okay if you say yes, because morning is a super powerful time to do things. It's nice to center my, I mean, I would be happy to do it any time of the day, but in mornings are nice because I just feel, yeah, I can breathe deeper. Yeah. My chest is lighter and I just feel more clarity for the day. Okay, so let's say yes, so that, that it's a morning habit that you want. Um, so this, uh, what you really have there is an abstract aspiration. Like I want to have meditation. I want this moment of calm. I want to have this ritual. It's not a specific behavior and right. that's okay. That's where everybody starts. So once you're clear that you want this, uh, we'll call it a meditation moment, whatever, then what you need to explore, what are the specific behaviors that could match? Uh, is it playing a musical instrument? Is it going outside and looking at the stars? Is it sitting in the corner in a chair and meditating? Is it flipping through a physical memory book and feeling gratitude, right? There's a hundred different things you could do. So that's really step one is for you to explore the variety of things. And I would say come up with 20 to 30 different options. Okay. Okay. Everyone kind of assumes it's meditation, sitting, being quiet, and lotus position. Yeah. That's one of dozens of options. And that right. may be the right one, but it may not be. So I'm saying explore. 
for me, what I found, it's actually playing a musical instrument. It's playing a flute. And I didn't oh, know wow. that, but that provides it for me because I'm getting the breathing. I'm getting the vibration. Wow. Who knew? Nobody goes out and says, play the flute. Every step called magic wanding. And there's more in the book, but essentially you're exploring your options. Then you go back and you pick the one, in this case, uh, if it's snacking or other kinds of things, you'd pick more than one. But in this case, we're looking for one. Okay. That one that you would think would be most effective and you can get yourself to do it. Yeah. Right? Because okay. you want it to be effective. And so um, you go back and identify of the list of 20 or 30, what's going to be highly effective and what can I really get myself to do, which yeah. is a combination of ability and motivation. You know, what can I get myself to do? Once you find that one, and let's say it's uh, playing the guitar, yep. you take that and you make it really small and easy. So rather than practicing the guitar for 30 minutes in the tiny habits way, you scale it back and you make it so simple, like strum three chords. Yep. And that then becomes the habit you design for. It's like, okay, I'm going to strum three chords in this meditative way or this way that connects me to a higher purpose. Um, journal, you, one, journal one sentence. Yeah, sentence. or even just open your journal. Yeah. Right? I, I mean, it could be even that simple. Just open the journal, but one sentence is great too. And then you find where does this fit naturally in my morning routine? What does it come after? So now you're finding how you can integrate this into your existing routine. Now with kids and unpredictability, sometimes that won't work and that's okay. The days it doesn't work, fine. If you pick it up elsewhere in the morning, that's okay. But some days it just won't work and that's fine. You just realize my routine got thrown off. Yep. So I wasn't able to strum the guitar, play the flute or write in my journal and that's okay, I'll do it tomorrow. And that's how you look at it. So you, you explore your options. So I'm summarizing here. Explore your options. Don't just latch onto one and assume it has to be meditation. You then pick one that you think is both effective and you can get yourself to do. Then you scale it back to be so tiny. It doesn't require much motivation. Yep. And then you find where to place it. What does it come after? Gotcha. And that's okay. how, and then you reinforce it through emotion. And, the, the, and we might get into that later. And if not, it's in the book. But that's how you would figure out what to do and when to do it yep. in a way that's not guessing, it's systematic. Well, then let's, let's okay, this is great. And then we got to hit this because everyone listening loves, I, my favorite part is the shine, the celebration. Yes. There's always, and I even read through your list, a shine, explain what a shine is to everybody before, and I'll look it up in so the book. Shine is a new name to be for. And in Tiny Habits, I had the opportunity to name this emotion. It's the feeling of success. The, the emotion you have when you succeed, there's not a name for it, not a, a clear name. And so that's the emotion you feel when you are trying to hit a three-pointer and you hit it, you see it go in. When you look on the wall at the exam scores and you got a perfect score, that's the emotion that you feel when you're trying to solve a puzzle and everything clicks together. Um, so that feeling here's, of success. Here's the hundred. Oh, Everybody and there's many, looking. many ways to help create this. Look at all so, those. High so, five yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we feel shine naturally when we succeed on like exams and solving puzzles and so on. And what that emotion does is a signal to the brain that you did something good and something that will help you. And that behavior then becomes more automatic. So it's emotion that creates habits. It's not repetition, like people will say and mislead you. It's emotions. Yeah, I've and always so, heard that, BJ. 21 yeah. times and you'll have the habit. No, it's not true. It's not true. Wow. Look at the research they're citing when they say that. And you'll see they're not interpreting the research. It, it, <laughs> It's not supported by the research. I can find no scientific evidence that repetition creates the habit. That's not true. It's emotion. And so sometimes it will happen naturally. Like say, for example, uh, I, I, I buy a new pen. Uh, this one's green, but in reality, it's purple pen for me. 
and using the purple pen, I was like, oh my gosh, my handwriting's better. I feel like I'm connecting better. So that feeling of success that my handwriting looks better and I'll be able to express myself better in the thank you notes yep. will wire in the habit of using the purple pen rather than the green pen. Wow. So notice this all around you. The products that you love, the products and services that you use, that you love, and then become part of your life, they have given you the feeling of success. They've given you shine. Wow. And that's what's wired it in. Wow. So you can take that natural dynamic and you can hack it. So when you sit down to play, let's see, what did you choose as your um, meditation behavior? Um, I actually like the guitar idea and guitar. probably a journal. I'll do journal and guitar. Okay, so let's start with guitar. Um, what I would do on that is the three chords you play, pick your favorite song, the one that makes you feel happiest. Don't pick a hard song where you're gonna stumble. Pick a song yep. that you love. And as you play it, um, recognize that you're succeeding in creating the habit, try to enjoy the music. And if you need even more than that, do the self-talk and say, way to go, Scott. Now, at that point, if you want to set the guitar aside and go on with your day, that's fine. You might have crying kids and that's fine. You've done the habit, you've succeeded. When you want to do more and you can, and this can even be day one, you can play the guitar for 10 or 30 minutes, but set the bar low and do the three chords. Good. Cause yourself to feel successful, whether it's just enjoying the music or giving yourself a high five or imagining yourself on a stage and everybody's cheering for you because you're a great guitarist. Yep. <laughs> which I think will of help your you best friend being happy for you. Yeah. Drum a happy beat on the wall. Do a subtle head nod. <laughs> clinch your fist yeah. and say, yes, there's a hundred yeah. of these that people can choose yeah. from. And it yes. really matters because it does ingrain the behavior. It does. And then in journaling, um, what I would do if, if, if I were doing journaling, my habit would just be open the journal and then I would draw a smiley face because it gets you writing and the smiley face will help you feel like happy and successful. Wow. That's and, cool. and, and if you write anything and you don't, doesn't matter. You've, so the habit is open the journal. Most of the times you open the journal, you'll actually write something that's meaningful beyond the smiley face. So that's how I would hack that one. I love it. Oh my goodness. So is this why people can go cold turkey? Oh. Is there emotional connection? <laughs> because in their emotion is potentially so high here that it causes that change. Yeah, that you know, and that's a more complicated situation. You know, cold turkey and stopping habits. Um, tiny habits is primarily about creating habits. Okay. But you can do use the tiny habits method to stop. Uh, I'll give a quick example here. Um, a true one from my life as I was changing how I ate and I realized eating bread at restaurants was not helping me. Eating all the nachos at restaurants was not helping me. I love nachos and I love <laughs> bread. So the tiny habit recipe became this. After I see the server approaching the table with bread or nachos, I will say, no bread, please, or no nachos, please. So notice by doing that habit, it's very, you know, it's like no bread, please. Three words. Yeah. The breads, the bread and nachos would not land on the table and I wouldn't eat them. So you can use the tiny habits method to reduce or stop unwanted behaviors like binging wow. on bread. Wow. Um, so behavior is behavior. It always comes back to motivation, ability, prompt. And the tiny habits method is a technique for creating habits for either big aspirations uh, or stopping behaviors. And there's a chapter on that as well. I, I actually have, you got to talk about the super fridge real quick, if you can, because <gasps> I know I have a picture. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to pull it up real fast. Um, this is you, um, consulted, was it Weight Watchers? Is that yeah. right? I trained and Weight Watchers, all their product people, along with my sister, Linda, we went to New York and they're on fifth Avenue and we went in and we, they were, their program had gotten really complicated. And they're like, it's a 50 year old program. It's evolved over the years. And we just added and added and it's too complicated. So we went in and helped them understand, you know, what I call behavior design. There's a version of that in the book. Yep. There's a professional version that I teach in my boot camps, And with that, they were able to hone in on exactly what the key components should be of their program and get rid of the things that were just adding clutter and that weren't working. Yes. Wow. Okay. I'm going to share my screen see if this works for a minute. So I'm going to share screen. 
Okay, can you see this? Super fridge. There we go. That's our fridge. This is <laughs> BJ's super fridge. And look at this. Everything in the fridge. So what's this idea of a super fridge? Explain this. Super to fridge is what you do is you prep all the food and you need to do it about once a week. You pre-prepare it, cut up the veg, you know, wash the veggies, cut them up, put them in containers, cook the quinoa, cook the lentils, and have things just ready to go. Wow. And only have in the fridge foods that are on your game plan. There's nothing in the fridge that you have to resist or say no to. So, and so everything in the fridge becomes like an exciting thing. I can have as much as I want. Yeah. I don't have to say no. No, no, no willpower required. If you're hungry, even at three in the morning, you open the fridge, you eat whatever you want. You don't have to use any willpower. And so that's one benefit. The so other cool. is it's so easy then to cook healthy meals. So if you're, you know, have 20 minutes for lunch, Bam, grab the quinoa, pull some out, grab some celery, grab some onions. Oh, maybe I'll throw in red peppers, throw them in a pan, saute them, then put yeah. in the mushrooms and boom, you got uh, it. We got it. We, we have three little kids at home, so we need to figure out how to hack our kids eating too. Because <laughs> I feel like I can eat healthy if, if there's no kids food anywhere around. So we might need to rethink what our kids are eating too. I, I agree with this principle so much. That's a brilliant idea. You just took away any potential temptation or a negative motivation that anyone would have. And your free, your fridge is now like, instead of just keeping things cold, your fridge is like this superpower, right? It's, like, yeah, yeah. your fridge is job. And this was the thing that surprised me. I knew that making good behaviors easy to do, good eating behaviors easy to do was important. What I didn't realize, and my partner and I did the super fridge, he mainly headed it up. He's very particular about the containers and, and so on. But what happened was the role of the fridge shifted away from, like you said, keeping food cold to now the job of the fridge is to help us eat on our game plan. Yep. That's what the fridge does. It's, like it's not about cooling things. It's this thing is the center of the kitchen and the kitchen's the center of the home. And so super fridge is like bullseye for helping you stay on your, your nutrition game plan. Wow. That's awesome. I, I think this, this uh, rule applies. We've already hit on 10 different ways that this tiny habit mindset applies. I got to share this quick one with you. My mm -hmm. next door neighbor, my best friend, Michael Bennett, he is an entrepreneur like me and like many of our listeners. And he has, you know, he's a real estate financer. They have um, a company that helps take people on trips to like have a soup by falls. And they're really, really cool. Nice. He's one of the nicest, most generous guys. He just started Mike's Grub. He started a restaurant. Okay. <laughs> um, and I love it. He just boldly went right into it. And he said, okay, we're going to launch this thing. It's, it's good food. It's healthy food. It's, it's really tasty food. And he got a lease right next to a car wash, which our other friend owns, oh, Andrew. Interesting. Interesting. And so now their thought was, it'd be really cool because they could get people going in the car wash and they could order food, then they go to the car wash and, and all that kind of stuff. That was the idea. So he spends all this money, starts the restaurant zero people from the car wash are getting food at the restaurant, right? He's getting Whoa. some traffic okay. from elsewhere. So we yeah. have this problem and this is literally in the last week. He started it oh, two and a half weeks ago. Okay. So we're sitting here trying to think, okay, is it motivation? Is it ability? Is it a prompt? And the more we analyzed and they were trying to give out like, you know, QR codes to people mm -hmm. as they go through the mm -hmm. car wash, but the inside of the, the restaurant is like on the side of the car wash. So it's out of their way a little bit. Yeah. No one's going to scan the QR code while they're in the middle of a car wash. They're trying to figure out how not to like die. So we went through all this. Okay. Is, are they hungry? Maybe they're not hungry. Maybe it's the wrong time of day. So we went through all this motivation, ability and prompt. And we realized that people just don't think about, oh, I can get a coffee or a breakfast burrito and then, you know, get it right after my car wash. They just don't know yeah. about it. So the knowledge isn't, wasn't really there. Yeah. And then the ability to do it wasn't super simple. And there was no prompt right in front of their face. So what, here's what we created. Are you ready? Okay, ready. I had this idea. This is all your credit. <laughs> there's a cart. Okay, so there's, you go, you can either go here when you drive in, you mm -hmm. can go to the restaurant or you can go around and do the car wash. Okay. Okay. And there's okay. a Y. At that uh -huh. Y... At that Y, I'm putting a cart, a, a, a locked wheel yellow cart that's the exact same size as like the window roll down for people to drive nice. on the right side. Yeah. And on that cart is a sign that says, press the button. 
Okay. Ooh. And there are four giant, like easy buttons in nice. a row yeah. on the cart. Okay. And there's four things that it says on there. It says, press the button in big, red, bold font. Okay. And they're driving right by that. Okay. And they don't yeah. have to go to the yeah. restaurant. And then yeah. it says, 90 seconds, orders ready. Wow. Never leave your car. Pay after wash. And, uh, so then there's, and there's another person, easy to do. All easy they got to do is do. literally go, bam. And it takes a picture of their car, yeah. sends the order inside. And it's the picture is like horchata, coffee, cinnamon roll for the morning, and then oh my breakfast gosh. burrito. <laughs> and then, this is literally, I've never had this idea before. Just because of your book, I was like, oh, this is the way nice. to do it. And so then we just, and it's a TV. It's going to be a TV. So for lunch and dinner, they just swap out the pictures for different types of food uh. for lunch and dinner. That's great. Like, you know, a salad to go, a taco for dinner. They even have pizzas and stuff. So it's all right there. And the dollar, it's $3, $4, $5. It's very simple. You can press up to five buttons and it just, you press the buttons and it's, and it's a little bit of a, a shine moment. So there's yeah. a little sound yeah. that goes off that says, nice choice. You know? <laughs> and, and it's a little red, it has a little red LED. So it's just very enticing yeah. to, to press the button. And then we have the uh, green umbrella over it. So okay. everyone knows that yeah, that's the spot. Yeah. And the same green umbrella for the kid who's sitting in the chair after the car wash taking their credit card. So with it's easy food. to identify. Again, easy, easy, easy. Easy, easy. So in literally, I think we clocked it at like 15 seconds. You can take the person's credit card. You swipe because it's already there. Um, no tip, just fast. And then they give them yeah. their food. No signing, nice. no nothing. I love that. And Way to go. Good job. So I will, I will update you on the progress, okay. but we immediately, when we went through it, we're like, oh my gosh, so many people are gonna buy from this thing. Yeah, I would, yeah, update me now. Clearly the restaurant's gonna do better, but also if you can get the car wash to track their customers, their customer loyalty and frequency is gonna go up. So it's gonna have the benefit also yep. of driving more traffic, increased traffic to the car wash. That's right. So we're excited. Like. Just simple, simple things like that. And even in Happy, right? The, the, yeah. the biotech wearable that you just got, we are creating simple ways to help prompt people, yeah. right? Would you like a calendar reminder for when you want to set this up, right? Yep. Let us yep. know if we can help you set up these prompts in your life to be more productive, get energy when you need to, better sleep. We'll just help you in the background, like not on your phone all day, but we can help people use these to have better habits throughout their day. Yeah, that's so great. It's, it's been so, so, so helpful for me. And I really, really appreciate your time. And this has been such a fun one. Okay, we got one more question or two. We okay. got to hear, we didn't hear your first, your my first sale story from, oh your, from when you were a, a youngster. Yeah. So let's go yeah. back to when you were a kid. Oh my gosh. Um, what was your first you know, because now you're an author, right? You're a speaker, yeah. an author. You have your own businesses. You're an entrepreneur. What was the first thing there, that you loved? That uh, you there are so many. I grew up in a home where it was all about being an entrepreneur. There was no word for it back then, but it was like, start your own company. And my dad, and especially my dad, and just generally it was like, yeah, why work for somebody else? Work for yourself. You know, start lawn mowing. I mean, we sold oranges door to door. We mowed lawns. We even sold contact lenses door to door, which was crazy at the time. That became 1-800-CONTACTS. Somebody stole our, basically, yeah, yeah. it goes on and on. But I'll, I'll, I'll pick a weird, I don't know what the first one was, but I'll pick a weird one. Okay. That was illegal. <laughs> but it was supported by my family because- okay. It was about learn to do business, learn to learn to sell stuff, learn to be an entrepreneur. Every summer we would go to Wyoming to have a big family reunion. I'm from um, at this, and Wyoming sold firecrackers. <laughs> so what my what my brother and I figured out, we could buy blocks of firecrackers in Wyoming, bring and. And within the block, you'd have like a pack of firecrackers that cost you about 10 cents. Yeah. We could bring them back to California and we could sell the little packs for $1.50. So our margins were a buck 40. So here we were, we knew it was kind of illegal. My parents <laughs> knew we were doing it. We were the firecracker people. And then we would sell those at school or people come to our house. <laughs> I know this sounds terrible, but we learned stuff. 
and our margins were great. And so we looked forward to going back to Wyoming, getting that the black awesome. cat firecrackers and bringing firecracker them brothers. <laughs> exactly. That is awesome. There Holy were so cow. many things we did. And I think the upshot of that, of the firecrackers, you know, just on and on. I mean, it was like here are the fog kids again selling us stuff was I learned, I developed confidence and I didn't realize this until I got into college and I was later considering jobs that I knew I could always make money. I knew that I, I could create a business or I could create something I could make money and that I did not have to take a job to get money. And what that allowed me to do was to pick whatever career path I wanted and take really big risks based on what I wanted, not on the fact I was going to get a paycheck because I knew I could make money. I didn't right. need the job. Yep. And that allowed me to do things in very unconventional way and take risks that really paid off big. And I attribute that to me being a kid, learning how to sell things, learning how to figure out how to run a business and so on. And so I had the confidence that I didn't have the fear that I, 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 I would have to just do something for the money. So I was able to follow my passions and I still do it today. I do projects and I do work that I just really love. Um, but the game changer was coming out of college with money in the bank, by the way. I had $10,000 in the bank after four degrees because I was wow. running my own little businesses and stuff. And then I took jobs that were uh, things I wanted to do and things I wanted to learn. That is awesome. And that's such an empowering thought, right? Yeah. That kids yeah, don't have to awesome. worry about, you know, what job you're going to get someday. You're, you don't have to worry. I mean, half the jobs are going to be completely new anyway yeah. in 15 years that no one's ever even thought of today. So you don't have to worry about it. What you can think of is what do you love to do? Mm -hmm. What are you good at? What do you, what, what do you mm -hmm. get flow time in? What's your passion? And if you can realize that you can turn things into a business or be successful, um, tr tr learning these basic principles of, of entrepreneurship, of what, what yeah. profit is, what margin is, how you make a dollar <laughs> 40 for every firecracker, that's an important principle, right? I mean, yeah. you know, if you're selling an, um, a class or an educational, you know, curriculum or something, an online educational thing, that's a lot of margin. That's really important to understand versus mm -hmm. like, a, a grocery store that has only 3% margin. If you sell apples for 50 cents, they probably cost them 45, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. so you want, this are, these are great principles that are better learned when you're a kid, when you have more freedom and risk and there's not a lot to lose. And yeah, it's great. And, and, and let me add to this, um, the, Scott, the role of my parents, the discussion around the dinner table could be about, you know, we're, we're gonna do this or why don't you try that? And we were actually discouraged from getting a job like at Taco Bell and stuff. It's like, uh, why don't you just try your own thing this summer? And if it fails, that's okay. It's wow. not about you making the money. Right. So we much, it was very, very clear to, to myself and all my siblings, it's seven kids in our family. We would much rather you have start your own thing and have it fail than you just go get a retail job or a Taco Bell job. That was totally clear that um, that doing your own thing was more valued and that failure wasn't like a big, huge problem Yeah, that just dive in and try it. And you're going to learn yeah. stuff by doing it. That's, that's my favorite thing to teach kid entrepreneurs. It's not win or lose. It's win or learn. Like you nice. losing is a, gr you, there's no losing because you know, it's just something you paid to learn. That's it. Right. <laughs> I like and that. Un unfortunately, I've made millions of dollar mistakes now, but those aren't <laughs> mistakes. Those are lessons learned. I, yeah. I paid for the most prestigious degree you could ever pay for. That was the most expensive degree. But guess what? I will not forget that lesson for as long as I yeah. live because yeah. I learned a lot and I'm better for it. Right. And so that's the thing is you win or you learn. Yeah, I, and, I, and that's why when you reached out to me and you told me about my first sales, like, I love it. I immediately got it because that, you know, if you said, BJ, what was the one thing that you did growing up that has changed the trajectory? It was that. It was having a home that valued uh, entrepreneurship, even though we didn't have a word for it back then, yep. and that supported you, and that it was about uh, that encouraged you to do that and supported you in that. That, that was the game changer. I didn't realize this, but I think we named it perfectly because the my first sale feeling 
the feeling mm -hmm. someone gets, not just the money, you're like, you're, you're exactly right. But the feeling you get that you made something with your own hands or your own mind that someone else needs or wants so much that they would pay you for it. The yeah. feeling of that is like such a freeing success feeling, right? That it's, it's like the perfect moment that everyone immediately gets it. So more, you know, I, I got lucky, I guess, before we met, we named the company. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. I'll just add one more thing. So my father's an eye surgeon and, but really a, a business person that happens to be a really good eye surgeon, but he would help us. Uh, like he'd help, we, 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 he owned some orange, orange orchards. We'd go pick the oranges or we would cook up wheat in this certain way. We'd buy the wheat in Idaho, bring it home and cook it up. And he would spend his time doing this. This dollars per hour, that was not a good investment for an eye surgeon at all. Right. But he knew, because he also kind of learned this from his father, who was very entrepreneurial, that this was a great investment of his time to help his kids learn these things. So even though it didn't make sense on the balance sheet in terms of dollars per hour for his time, in terms of helping us learn and change again. So I just want to point that out. It may not make sense in the near term in terms of dollars and cents, but you're investing uh, the investment you're making your kids and helping them do this just pays off massively. Yeah. Yeah. That's some of the best things we can do. So, oh man, this was a great conversation. BJ, thank you so much thank for having you. this. So there you have it, you guys. Uh, BJ Fogg, one of the, probably the world's most renowned behavior design specialist, uh, teaches us tiny habits and how they can change everything. BJ, thanks again. This was a fantastic day. Thank you so much.